These are the continuing voyages of the basics on railway signals, to seek out early signals and safety devices, and to boldly go where few YouTube episodes have gone before. Hello and welcome to part two of the basics on early railway signals. The story so far. The earliest British mainline railways had adopted a system of signalling based around constables standing every mile of the line, equipped with flags and lamps. White meant all clear, green caution and red to stop. However, hand lamps and flags were not terribly visible, so instead flags were run up poles, but unless there was a stiff breeze, these two were pretty useless. Instead of flags, iron boards painted red were erected in their place, and these of course were more visible. The safety management system on lines like the Liverpool and Manchester remained pretty much unchanged between opening in 1830 and amalgamation in summer 1845. It was down to other railways to build and improve upon what the Liverpool and Manchester had done. The first wave of trunk railways built in the later 1830s all adopted fixed signalling methods. They were more visible than constables with flags and hand lamps, but as a failsafe they still retained these constables. The Grand Junction Railway, which ran from Birmingham in the English Midlands to join the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, opened in 1837, and it had fixed signals on its entire route. These were D-shaped iron boards, painted red, and surmounted by a lamp capable of showing red or white lights. If the red board were visible, it meant stop, and if it were not visible, it meant all clear. At night, a red lamp for danger and a white for all clear. The North Midland Railway adopted a similar system using rectangular boards. The Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway, thanks to the redoubtable captain, later Admiral Cheeseman, yes, that was his Christian name, Cheeseman Henry Binstead, Royal Navy, adopted what became known as spectacle signals. They consisted of two iron discs, each about two feet in diameter, mounted on a spindle and capable of being turned through 90 degrees. On top was a lamp showing red or white. When both red discs and the lamp were visible, it meant stop. And when the discs weren't visible and the white light was, it meant all clear. The problem with these early fixed signals, however, was that they were a binary system. They were either on or off. Furthermore, the system whereby if you could not see the signal meant it was safe to proceed was fundamentally dangerous. If the signal were damaged or had been knocked over, any oncoming train would presume the line was safe, irrespective of any dangers ahead. So other engineers put on their thinking caps. In 1841, Isambard Kingdom Brunel adopted a form of fixed signal using a disc and crossbar for use on his Great Western Railway. All clear was signalled by the disc being visible. Danger was indicated when the crossbar was visible. At junctions, level crossings and stations, arrow-shaped fantail signals were used. One side was painted red, and the other was painted green. When the red side was visible, with the arrow pointing to the right, it meant to stop. When the green side, with the arrow pointing to the left, it meant caution, and if it couldn't be seen at all, it meant all clear, and at night, coloured lamps were used, red, green and white. The forward-thinking chaps on the Caledonian Railway also adopted a similar system, capable of showing danger, caution and all clear. Inspired by the Frenchman Claude Chappé, who invented a form of optical mechanical semaphore in the 1790s, other companies adopted signals based on this semaphore technology. These did away with all the paraphernalia of discs, crossbars and arrows. They were first adopted at the recommendation of John Erpeth Rastrick, who had been one of the judges at the Rainhill Trials, on the London and Croydon Railway in 1842, and the semaphore signal became the standard type of signal in the United Kingdom. Here a signal post, topped by a lamp, had a movable arm. 
the movement of which mirrored approximately those of early hand signals. They were what are known as lower quadrant signals, so that the signal arm moved in an arc downwards from the horizontal. If the arm were horizontal, it meant danger. If it were inclined at 45 degrees, it meant caution, and if it were not visible, it meant all clear, and these positions were reproduced by the lamp, showing red, green, and white. The danger of lower quadrant signals was if they broke, the weight of the arm would return it to an all-safe position. The danger of this type of signal was revealed in an accident to the Flying Scotsman at Abbots Ripton in 1876. During a snowstorm, the signal arm froze in its slot and could not be raised to the danger position. In the aftermath, an investigation was carried out by the Board of Trade. It revealed a fundamental problem with signalling in the UK at that time. The default position of all signals was all clear rather than danger. As a result, the Board of Trade ruled that from now on the default position for all signals was to be danger, and they also recommended the abolition of the slotted signal post so that the arm could never again be frozen into the slot. But lacking the suitable legal mechanisms to do so, it wasn't until 1892 that these recommendations were actually put into practice. The Board of Trade also recommended the abandonment of a white light to mean all clear, If the colour lens of a signal lamp fell out, then instead of showing danger, red, or caution, green, it would simply show a white light, meaning all clear. Again, very dangerous, but there was no legal recourse to force every railway company to change its signals. Another problem with using red and green lights and flags was that of colour blindness. It wasn't until 1868 that eyesight tests, including for colour blindness, became mandatory for locomotive crews and guards. All of these types of fixed signal were what we would now term a home signal. That is, they protected a specific location on the railway, such as a junction or level crossing or a station or even a tunnel. There was nothing to warn an oncoming train as to the state of the signal it was approaching. And this was something that became increasingly important during the 1840s, as train speeds rose ever higher. The earliest form of distant signal, then known as an auxiliary signal, were adopted by the London and North Western Railway in the later 1840s. Each station, tunnel and so forth possessed two sets of signals. One consisted of a red painted disc on a tall mast and this was used to show danger. This was accompanied by a shorter mast, surmounted by a green disc topped by a lamp capable of showing red, white and green. To stop a train, the red disc and the red lamp were shown, and the red lamp and disc were to be shown for a full five minutes after a train had passed through or departed. The red signal was then turned off and the green signal and green lamp turned on and displayed for a further five minutes. After a further five minutes, creating a full interval of 15 minutes, the green signal and green lamp were turned off and the white all clear lamp was displayed. Positioned 500 yards or so ahead of the station signal were what were then termed as the auxiliary signals. This distant signal consisted of a green board and a green lamp. When the red signal at the station was turned on, thanks to rods and wires, this distant or auxiliary signal was automatically changed to show a green board and a green lamp, indicating caution and that the signal ahead was at danger, and this would cause the driver of an oncoming train to slow down. Experiments were also made in the mid-1840s on the Liverpool and Manchester section of what was then the LNWR using colour light signals, but those will have to wait for another time. So that is the concluding part on early railway signalling. As train speeds grew ever faster, the railways had to respond in kind in terms of safety, and as we have seen evolved to a more modern state, with both home and distant signals being in use by the end of the 1840s. 
If you have any questions or would like a part the third, let me know in the comments below. If you have enjoyed this video, please share, like and subscribe. And if you are interested in the Victorian Railway, perhaps you'd like to check out my book, Working on the Victorian Railway, available from Amberley Books.